also work in a university. I run a master's course online. So I've got plenty of experience through Don't mm. Forget the Bubbles and the university of running stuff online. But also I have lots of experience building community online, mm-hmm. um, which is really important as well. Like you can run, you can deliver content online, but actually building that community when everyone's remote is a challenge. And I realized that I could bring all of these things together to help make it make it better than one to one so one to one fine you get our- so let's get real our value as doctors has significantly diminished over the last decade so how can we turn that around by upskilling and creating rewarding and impactful careers on our own terms welcome to disrupting doctors careers I'm your host, Dr. Abena Bubbers-Jones, and I'm on a mission to connect one million talented doctors with the best in diverse career opportunities. Welcome to today's episode of Disrupting Doctors' Careers. Having a mind break is such an amazing day. This is the second podcast I've done today, let me just be clear, um, with some amazing, I've got two amazing speakers, but today we have Dr. Tessa Davis, before I even introduce her, one of the things I've noticed as an entrepreneur, as a doctor, um, particularly in the last five to 10 years, is the growth of the education, training, coaching market. And we see that a lot of doctors are really hot on medical education and particularly in the tech sector, but none of them really consider the amazing impact and potential of starting your own online course with the existing technologies by the way there's lots of platforms for this and really scaling it so tessa is incredible she is a pediatric emergency medicine consultant and she is the founder of ace your consultant interview academy so it's very clear on what she does and you know as we know as doctors and in entrepreneurs the service delivery but is actually the easiest bit but actually starting a, actually spotting a gap in the market starting a business growing and scaling it to tens of thousands of people now that takes work that takes consistency that takes commitment and that takes passion and tessa has all of those things so let's let's basically start this conversation to really understand like why why she did this what it takes and how you can absolutely do this too if you are passionate about education and sharing your knowledge with the world so welcome Tessa thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me awesome so yeah let's let's get started because obviously you know this is an alternative careers platform for doctors and you've clearly branched out and doing something really exciting leveraging what you've learned and gained in the in the NHS but what is it that made you realize that there was a, a gap in the market when it came to supporting doctors in their consultant interviews well it's not so much that I realized there was a gap in the market as firstly I realized that I had a problem <laughs> So oh, I used yeah. to be, re- I used to be terrible, at, really terrible at interviews. When mm-hmm. I was first trying to get into pediatric training, my interview technique was so bad that I couldn't get on a training post for a couple of years. I was in non-training posts because my I was just like a sweaty, rambling mess in my interviews. Um, and you kind of carry that, like when you start thinking that you're terrible at interviews or knowing I was terrible at interviews, it was a fact, uh, then that kind of carries with you. And as I progressed through my career, I did some other interviews for various roles that were equally awful. But when it came to my consultant interview, I it, the stakes were a lot higher because, you know, you really want like this is your chance to get your dream job and I I knew that like I had to do something different, and I, I went on the uh, there's a course that exists or that existed already then, and I went on it, and it was like a one day course, and it was it was fine, but it wasn't like it didn't give me enough, it didn't give me what I needed to help me get the confidence that I needed and the structure to be able to do the interview, and so I started kind of working out ways to improve that myself, um, and then I realized once I had worked out how to do it. Um, because it's not rocket science, as you can learn, anyone can learn how to do it. Like that I was able test, to... right? It is, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you will be able to get there. So I realized that I could um, help other people do the same. And I started to do that just on a, on a one-to-one basis. And that was really how I realized that I could make a difference helping other people to improve their skills as well. That That's really wonderful to hear because, you know, 
like so many people like even myself it always starts with the problem that you have and that you're experiencing and then you realize that yeah. actually there was a lot of people that experience the same thing and I know a lot of doctors they'll think oh well someone else is doing that already but there's always room to do something better or do it in a different more effective way and especially if it helps you it's guaranteed to help a lot of people so it's great that you had that insight but again like how did you how did you get to client number one, for example? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's like the hardest bit, right? Yeah, it is really hard. So the, at the beginning, it would have just been helping people that I work with, you know, or mm -hmm, people that mm -hmm. I know who are, who are practicing and prepping. But I have run courses and content for other people through, like I run Don't Forget the Bubbles, which is a pediatric educational organization so mm. I'm kind of familiar with the idea of charging people for content um mm -hmm. so I think you know at, at one point we ran an interview course through don't forget the bubbles and I realized that you know it is something that you could charge people for and based off that I then did some one-to-one -one coaching with the odd person here and there um and it kind of went from there but that was that was an important kind of stepping stone brilliant so like you know and, and yeah a lot of doctors are those people that tend to go into these things, they usually have had some exposure experience or connection to someone or something to then build upon. Um, so it's great to hear that you leveraged existing skills and knowledge to actually get something started and actually have the confidence to do that. And I see a lot of doctors really underestimate those extracurricular activities that may not have like got you that you know, membership or fellowship in the first place, but actually it's, it's hugely valued and even more so recognized, especially if you are stepping outside of your traditional clinical pathway. So, I uh, mean, at what point or what was it that made you think, right, this is something I can actually grow and make a real solid business out of? Well, I think it's exactly what you're saying, which is that you realize you've got all these skills from other things. So I've done lots of online education, um, I also work in a university. I run a master's course online. So I've got plenty of experience through Don't mm. Forget the Bubbles and the university of running stuff online. But also I have lots of experience building community online, mm -hmm. um, which is really important as well. Like you can run, you can deliver content online, but actually building that community when everyone's remote is a challenge. And I realized that I could bring all of these things together to help make it make it better than one-to-one -one. so one-to-one -one, fine you get an hour and you talk to someone or whatever and you give them some tips but actually being able to bring that together so that I'm not just help I'm not just helping you for an hour but I'm there for the whole way until you get your job and that you're there with other people as well um that are all going through the same thing and to tie that in with being able to deliver it through good educational um techniques and in a way that's flexible and adaptable for people it kind of was able to tie in all the things I loved um that were out that I'd, were skills I'd learned in various ways allied to, to medicine and bring them all together to make sure improve what I was offering to people to help them with their interview prep and to get their jobs yeah, I echo everything you're doing as as a as a fellow educationalist. I I'm not sure if that isn't the right word, trainer, educationalist. But the community, again, I think that's something that's really underestimated, the power of that. Like the one-to-one -one is great. It's got its place and you can really help mentor someone, but it's that community and people realizing that they're not on their own in their challenges. And actually their challenges are, unfortunately are not that unique. Right. Yeah. And and but then also seeing like the diversity of different ways to approach it is also hugely valuable. And then as you said, being with them there on that journey, not just kind of one-off shots now and again, um, and that they can have access to you, but also like this enables you to scale yourself in that sense. So before we even get into the scaling bit, um, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about like what, I mean, you've talked about some of the technical skills that you've had to develop, but again, like the, let's talk about the actual doing of this, right? So, you know, you've, you know what your product is, you know what your service delivery is. How do you decide how to actually package that? How you decide actually promote it, selling it? Like, what did that take? What did that involve? Take a step um, by step if you can, very high level though. <laughs> so the the content side is the, for me the easiest part because I've got the most experience with it. So I'm aiming to deliver what they need to get the job. Yeah. 
and knowing that people are stretched for time because you know at that stage of life you've got kids you've got a mortgage you're doing all your shifts you're trying to coordinate with your partner and it's you don't have time and people just often put off their prep so you know you wait for the perfect day or the perfect afternoon and then it, it doesn't come so I, I, I'm wanted to design something that could be done like if you've only got seven days you can do it in seven days if you've only got two minutes now you can get started with the first step so um the content was I designed to be flexible and for what people need um, and to give a range of ways that you can join or consume the content. So that's, you know, videos, live, co live calls, coaching calls, whatever, like loads of different stuff, documents you can read. So um, that part, I f it was the, the easiest for me because of my experience. The other parts on, on the, business side you know how do I how do I get it to people how do I know what to charge that's all more difficult for me because uh, that's not my natural or it wasn't my natural area uh, you know it's not something that we get experience of in uh, the NHS so that's been uh, a, a, a process of learning from other people this is uh -huh. the same as we do you know it's the same as you doing anything you you learn from people who have been there before and who uh -huh. have done it um, and who have made the mistakes that uh -huh. they're trying to help you avoid making, but you probably uh -huh. will make some of them anyway. Uh -huh. So <laughs> that's kind of that. That's what I've been doing is trying to learn from people and to develop it as I go. Um, I I do a lot of social media anyway. I've got a, you know I've got a large audience on Twitter. I started doing Instagram, so uh, really reaching people through social um, has been good for me. And I've already had a good sized email list, so. That's been the main ways that I've been reaching people. And the good thing about medicine is it's, it is a smallish community. So it's word of mouth. You know, when, if, you, if you're going for a job interview, you'll ask someone who you work with what they did when they were going for their job interview. Um, and so word of mouth uh, is starting to spread. And as I grow, it um, will continue to spread. So that's that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I think that's great. And just, just going back to the whole social media piece and the, the marketing piece, let's say, um, again, I, I love, so on our fellowship um, and even on our travel entrepreneurs, one of the biggest fears that comes up again and again and again is I don't want to be on social media. I can't do what that person is doing. It's really scary. I just don't want to put myself out there. I've got nothing to say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is like bona fide fears. I mean, I have those fears. You'd be surprised. And a lot of people you'd be surprised that are doing on social media also have those fears. Um, but the difference with them, and I speak from a personal perspective, like as you, you talked about, you know, you're doing this to gen like to help people, to reach people who want your help. But the only way to do that beyond the word of mouth marketing, which you can't control that well, is to put yourself out there and reach as many people and scale what you're doing. So I'd love to hear your experience again, like you talked about using Twitter. I personally boycott that space because of that certain person who now owns it. But like, you know, you've, you've gone on these platforms and, and, and really amplified your voice. We talk about this um, in some of our previous podcasts, like with Karen Rajan and how he's got 2 million followers talking about health misinformation. But um, how did you overcome maybe some of the barriers that you may have initially experienced? And what do you think it was that drew a lot of people to you to say, hey, like, actually, what she's doing is great. I'm going to sign up to your mailing list. So I'm going to engage with your content. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's it's not a quick thing. It's a slow mm. process. I mean, I uh, appreciate you, you. You know, Twitter has changed in the last few years. I've been on it for since, you know, 10 years or what, maybe longer. I don't know. So it's it's not like you don't suddenly post something and it goes viral overnight. And the next thing you know, you've got a, a bazillion followers. That's not that's not how it works. It's just consistency. And one of the things to say, which I found at the beginning, because I was like that too, you get really stressed. Like you, you spend ages writing something, you're you know, a finger's poised over the publish button, you're nervous to do it. But actually, when you publish something, although you care a lot, nobody cares on the other end. It's not like the world isn't waiting for your first Instagram post. Um, so it's really, <laughs> then you realize that actually it's not, you know, it's not, you're not as important as you think you are. Um, and you realize that no one cares. And once you get over that and you get used to just pressing publish, 
then it becomes a lot easier. And it's not that it all goes smoothly because it's social and, you know, think you'll say the wrong thing at some point and something will happen or someone will say something mean. But in the grand scheme of things, you'll realize that it's it doesn't matter. You're you're just posting content, but you have to you have to put yourself out there. And particularly like with with me, I I work really closely with the people on my in my academy, so I I get to know them. I really care. Like I I really want them to get the job. So it's it is me and the the you know I work I work with another co coach. It's it's me and them that they're coming for. It's not so the putting yourself out there is important. So they know who you are, what they're getting, what you're like. Um, and and that's why like it's important to show you because you you are who they're coming to for your service. Um, so it's easy to hide, but I don't think it helps. And it's not as scary as you think it will be. And I, I completely echo every, every single last letter that you just said, um, particularly the no one really cares what you post really, especially at the beginning. Like, yeah. you know, no one's even, even, even when you've amassed a following, um, I mean, I can't say I've got like millions of followers, but again, you'll post some stuff out. Some things will resonate. Some things won't. But it, as you said, it's the consistency over time and the picture that people start building of you and what you do and how you can help them. That really matters. It fires the whole word of mouth marketing even more, it amplifies that even more. Um, and do you find like I, I mean, Medic Footprints, I've been doing that for 10 years, right? And I've found that there are people who are engaging with me now who've been following us for 10 years. <laughs> and like, you know, it's it's a lot, as you said, it's a long game. And yeah. particularly doctors, like being being the target market, target audience, like I find that doctors do take several years before they actually do anything or talk to you or press a button. I mean, what have you what have you exactly. done? Well, that's exactly, that's why you do, like when you send your emails out, you'll have people who have been on your mailing list for a long time that don't leave your mailing list, but they might not have signed up for anything. Mm -hmm. But you'll be able to see that they're reading, they're opening the stuff. And, you know, particularly with like the stuff you do, it may be a while. It may be something they're thinking about now, but not ready to go on. Mine's mine's like time specific because when your interview is coming up, it's coming up. Um, and there's nothing, yeah. you, you know, you can't change that. Whereas, yeah. you know, other, other in, in yours and other people's, you've got, people might think about it for a few years and then, yeah. you know, they, you're, you're building that trust the whole time. Mm -hmm. The same as, you know, me and in, in interview tips, you build the trust the, the, the whole time. So they know what you offer, that you know what you're doing, you know what you're talking about. And then when it comes to them thinking about, you know, careers outside of medicine or thinking about doing their interview, they'll think, oh yeah, you know, Tess has been emailing me for a year about this. Um, so she's the person that I'm going to go to. And you can't always like define that in a metric. Um, but you know, that's what, that's the reason that we're, that it's worthwhile con being consistent with the content that you're putting out. Absolutely. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly in this space and especially community, actually, I, I would say community is now seen as a core factor for any business success. That's not just the online medical education space. It's any business. Why? Because consumers really drive your brand they help define your brand. They help you sell because that's who you're selling to. And then they, again, word of mouth, you know? Yeah. And so that, that's what they say. If you if you read like um, Harvard's business, business Review or any, any place, to be honest, they'll say a lot more. Even the, the established brands, um, you know, the Amazon, it's all about community, building community around your brand um, in order to ensure that your, your company is sustainable and will well outlast you in many ways you know what I mean it's yeah. like it is that demand especially if you're in a you know a lot of people go into tech and they're looking for investment I was speaking to a, a femtech founder the other day and she was like yeah you know we, we could just really do with like 50k to get this off the ground we've got 50 users like what would you recommend we do and I was like listen my recommendation to you is focus on each one of those 50 users and ask them what are they loving about your platform now and just build on that. Focus on the people that are using what you and, and get as many referrals, testimonials, and everything. And that is how you grow your business. And only get yeah. investment when you don't need it anymore. That's interesting that you mentioned about speaking to people because that's actually something I've been doing in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Is so I've had about two hundred people go through the academy now. Nice. Um, and I'm started doing a deep dive with them. So. Uh, 
I offered for any of them, it invited them to come and meet with me. It's like 45 minute chat. And I, I find out more about like how they came to me, how they found it. Um, and you think you know things because obviously I spend a lot of time with them anyway, running the cohort, but actually having that space to like really dig deep into why, you know, how they found me, what they thought about it, where they looked for other stuff is really eye opening and has been massively helpful for me. Um, just, I can give you like one practical, obvious example. Um, so I do all my stuff on social. So most people come to me from, they find me from Instagram or Twitter. Mm -hmm. um but um what well I won't ask uh, as a rhetorical question but what would if you were looking and what I did when I was looking for interview prep um courses was you go onto Google and you Google interview prep whatever consultant <laughs> interview prep courses yeah but yeah. I, I'm not on Google I don't I don't show because it's not the way I've set up my business or the website or anything like that oh, um, so you wouldn't even things. you wouldn't even find me it's not yeah mm. SEO but not even like my yeah my website wouldn't even index on on Google um and it's it's just not something yeah. I've thought of um and it seems very obvious when you say it now but I've run the course I ran the course for the first six seven eight months without even considering it um as I started to speak to people I realized like when I asked what else did you do when you're looking for your interview prep courses well obviously they go to google and they search um then it's it's actually a quick it's relatively quick fix and easy win um but th that's just like one example of uh things that you can learn that are very simple that can totally change how you run the business and can make a massive difference to it as well yeah no absolutely and then the deep dive I mean I think that's really interesting um and again this is one of the things like we know that testimonials drive business etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but the getting of testimonials in an organic way can be quite challenging at times. So I'd love to hear more about the deep dive experience. Like, how do you get people yeah, to so, do it, et cetera, et cetera? Well, the deep dive is different. So I actually have worked hard to get testimonials. And I think they're the biggest thing that help to um, not necessarily, they won't help people find me in the first place. But when people find me, when yeah, they see the testimonials, they realize yeah. a lot of them said that in the deep dive, they realize like, oh, there's loads of people like me and they're not like fake. You know, when you see testimonials for someone you don't know and you think they're all just fake people, but these are like people that you would know. You don't necessarily need to know them, but you know who, the type of person that they are and you know they're real. Um, So getting yeah. testimonials has been massive. So after each person secures their job, their substantive consultant job, I ask them if they will record a testimonial with me. They can see the others that are there. Um, I don't know, I've probably got, I would say 25 or 30 or something so far um and i record a chat with them but the deep dive is is separate from that it's not it's not um recorded for sharing it's not a testimonial mm -hmm. it's for me to understand more about them and more about how to reach other people like them and how to make the course better for them or mm -hmm. people like them in future and that's mm -hmm. been really helpful in helping me improve it um and improve access to it mm -hmm. i think that, i think that's a really important part of growing a business just really being able to see see it from other people's lens especially when you're like you're working on your business or in your business or both and it's so difficult to kind of see the wood through the trees sometimes but the most important thing is to really understand how your ideal customer um like where where they've come from what their that the processes that they go through in making a decision to buy what other things they look at what you know yeah. all of those factors like really understanding the avatar so we always talk about really understanding your target audience um and the power of the niche and I actually really want to talk about I'm really excited about this conversation actually um because when I first started Medic Footprints actually no throughout the journey so so many times people said to me um oh have you considered doing it for non-doctors like mm. nurses and I was like you know I was like I could do but I've been like this community has been really successful just doing it for doctors and you know, like you, like I set this up pretty much because of my own personal challenges. And I don't really know what the challenges are for other healthcare professionals. Mm. So I wouldn't want to pretend that we could like create an organization for them. Um, and it is the power of the niche, particularly now. They say the power of the niche is like so, so important because knowledge is so accessible at everyone's fingertips. And when you're looking for something, you are looking for something that is specific to yeah. you. And I know obviously with like, you know, looking at your competitors, for example, when it comes to consultant 
in NHS interviews. I'm sure there's a number of these around, right? But it is about like focusing on the niche, focusing on your unique selling points as Tessa Davis, as to like one of the key, the key sales to differentiate you from other things out there. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, yeah, your niche. Yeah. Like how important is that to you, especially now looking at scaling this business? Yeah. Well, I guess two separate things that have, that come to mind then. So one is the niche and one is how are you different from your competitors? So the difference from the competitors is um, easy for me because I don't offer the same thing. So it's over a longer period of time, I have daily contact with the people in, in the academy and they're guaranteed with me until they get their job. So once you're in, you can just stay in until you, until you get your job. So it's as opposed to like going on a one day course um, and then it's it's done. So it's a very different um, offering, um, different content and stuff and a different service. Um, the niche, I mean, I, I agree with what you say. Yeah, so you can say, well, and, and people have said like, do you do interview tips for, you know, will you help me prep for my whatever non-medical interview? You know, the truth, the reality is probably 80% of the stuff is transferable because yeah. it's similar questions, yeah. but, you know, similar mm -hmm. skills. But you, exactly what you say, you, you want to offer something that is as tailored to who you're aiming for as it can be. And as someone, if you were looking, if I was looking for um a course, an interview course, and it was like general interview course for, I don't know, people in the UK or, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't go on it because I wouldn't think it was for me. As soon as if I saw an interview course for people who were born in Glasgow, moved to London, you know, are doing their uh, <laughs> pediatric emergency medicine consultant interviews, then you can be sure that I am going to pay whatever it is to get on that course because it's definitely for me and obviously you can't go too niche um so you need to have you need to have a reasonable number of people in your market but the more specific <laughs> you can be the more you're going to get the audience and actually what you get is you do get some people on the periphery so like on the periphery of mine would is people who maybe are a few years before thinking about their consultant interviews or people who um uh, people who are in nursing, for example, who consume a lot of my content, they won't necessarily come on the courses, um, but it helps broaden your audience and it helps with that word of mouth thing as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Because I know a lot of doctors, especially in our fellowship program for doctors in industry, they're all really, scared, not all of them, but like some of them are really, and I, and I was like this as well, really scared to niche down yeah. because it's that kind of feeling, that mindset of scarcity, like, oh, that means that there's going to be a lot less people I'll be able to work with. But I'm always like, hey, that's great because it means you can really focus, target and target your energies to the people that you can genuinely help. You cannot, you cannot help everybody we're past that generation right we're past that yeah. now it's about finding that select group of people which could still potentially be in the millions if you really wanted it to yeah. Yeah. that that is going to benefit from your service because you know we talk about when business planning the total addressable market and the serviceable market and all of those things but it, but it is like you know you can provide a better high quality service when you really understand the avatar of the people that you're serving Right. Exactly. It's like if I if I just helped had helped these 200, 200 random people in different <laughs> professions go through their interviews in the last year versus yeah. helping 200 NHS doctors succeed in their substantive consultant interviews. The, the experience that that brings is, you know, you it's not equaled. So um, you can't, you know, you, you, the the support then that you can give to your audience in future is much, uh -huh. is going to be much better. Brilliant. So uh, let's move on. I mean, this is such a great great conversation I love it um there's two things so actually NHS so I mean you're still a clinician in the NHS and you're providing this service which which really benefits the NHS why didn't you do it in the NHS um as part of the NHS. as in why why didn't I do it I wouldn't even have thought it was an opportunity I suppose I think probably <laughs> barriers to making things happen <laughs> might be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like uh well, I think we all know it's difficult to implement stuff in the NHS. It's not that I don't like I, I help my colleagues do uh, interview prep. So um, it's not that I'm not doing it in the NHS. But as far as like implementing something formal in the NHS um, is 
in the too hard basket, I would say. And mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. easier, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why we set up Don't Forget the Bubbles to provide education and um, community that we could we can make changes quickly. You don't need like a million committees and working groups to get things passed. You just make a decision and you do it. Mm -hmm. And I, it's it, for someone like I, I've got a short attention span. That's why I work in oh, emergency yeah. medicine. I like to get things done. And I yeah. don't, yeah, I just, the idea of waiting through the process to get make that happen is probably not, I don't know, too too much of a challenge, I would say. Brilliant. And, you know, again, a lot of doctors do worry about doing things outside of the NHS whilst they're in the NHS. Have you, have you experienced any challenges along those lines? Um, and also from the time management element? Um, what sort of challenges are, do you mean other than time management? You're... Uh, com like conflict, consider concerns about conflict of interest, concerns about, well, if I'm earning money doing something that's like, you know, could uh, be done on NHS time. Yeah, do, you know, okay. do you know, do you know what I, I mean? Yeah. Like the, those kind of yeah. things that tends to come I, up. I've, so I've, I've, he I've have, that has been mentioned like um, not formally yeah. um but I've as in I've heard people say I wonder if that would be an issue I've yeah. never had it be an issue um <laughs> I work mm. you know yeah I guess it's about separation I have different roles anyway so I'm yeah. not just in the in the, the uh, NHS I have a university mm. um, appointment so I do different things anyway and I always have done um so I think you know as long as you're clearly separating time then I don't mm -hmm. you know I, I don't see it being an issue um, you know, it's not something that you would, while you were on your NHS time or your university time, you wouldn't work on that. And while you're on that time, you wouldn't work on the other thing. So I think you just need to be clear about boundaries yeah, from a absolutely. time management in general point of view. It's, um, you know, it's difficult. One of the things I've tried to do is, um, make my, uh, make, make the course be able to be delivered in a way that my time is focused, so I've brought other people into the team to help, um, not just my co-coach, but, you know, admin people, uh, community manager and so on to help take the things off my time that can be done by other people so that I'm able to do the bits that I add most value to. And so that's really helped me streamline the amount of time I work on it so that when I'm working on it, it's really helping the people who are in the academy. Um, right. not doing the rest of the admin stuff and that's made a massive difference um, right. but yeah I mean it's it's a challenge I I, I am on sabbatical from the NHS this year though oh, I'm, right. on, I, I'm I'm uh, working still doing my university role but not the NHS role mm -hmm, um, uh -huh. for, so that that has given me the time to be able to set this up and scale it and what I'm trying to do is make it um, bring all these people in to help me so that it can be run efficiently going forward, but still delivering the same quality. Brilliant, brilliant. And yeah, I mean, the last point is on the scaling element. So we see people, they'll go into, a, you know, solopreneur type business or a service-based business where it just be themselves. Um, and then they get to a point where it's doing well, but obviously they can't, there's only one of them. And, you know, that, that IP, that creativity can only go so far when it's one of you. So yeah, it'd be lovely for you to just expand a little bit more on how you've gone about scaling your business and your plans for the future. Um, the first thing I did was to get a VA in. Um, that was the to, to help me with the admin side of running it. Um, and this, And then I've got a community manager who helps set up um, and kind of oversee the making sure everyone's in the community okay, checking on links, you know, helping people get what they need. Um, so that's been very helpful. I've also recently got a digital marketing assistant who helps with all the email automations, sending out stuff before they come into the cohort. So in the kind of marketing and sales side of things, which has been great. Um, and I brought in a, a co-coach, um, who is someone who is a friend of mine who I've worked with for many years. Um, and so we work really well together. So the combination of these things has been great. One thing that I found really helpful, um, when bringing in the community manager and the digital marketing assistant is actually documenting 
everything, every stage of the process is like an SOP for community management or for the digital marketing, because the first five months was me. I'm going to press this. This is going to start. I'm going to do this then and on this day. And it's all like in your head or maybe written on a few very various places, but the actual act of going So I use Monday for project management, but going on to Monday, creating a board and putting in, this is what you need to do for this step. Here's a video of how to do it. This is what you need to do for this step. And so that someone else can then take that and run it um, without you. That That's the, the the best way to make it sustainable. It takes time to transition all of that yeah. and to show them yeah. and, to, and also for you to document it properly and not miss stuff. But it, yeah. putting that down is really helpful. And it also clears your own head because all that stuff's been in your head. You, you yeah. know, I kind of go over the same thoughts, the same tasks again and again. And it's like, actually, yeah. it's all here. You just go yeah. through it step by step. So that, yeah. that's that been really helpful. Yeah, and, and I, I totally agree. And that's one of the... My ongoing challenges, but actually in the last few years, we've definitely done a lot more on processes with any like processes change. We think actually there's a quicker way to do this. And actually one thing I'm getting into more, I don't know if you're getting into it, is uh, like the automations and AI. Love because... an automation. <laughs> Love an automation. I literally, I don't think my life would run without automations. <laughs> Love automations. But like the thing is, in order to use automations, you've got to, you've got to know what your process is and be happy that yeah. it works and then you automate the hack out of it. <laughs> yeah. That's what I, I can't doing. If you open my Zapier account, there's probably like oh a my billion God. automations or like... <laughs> You're getting commission yeah. off Zapier. Oh my God. Yeah, Zapier <laughs> saves saves the day on a lot of things. Brilliant. So um, that's there's been so much gold in this conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, clearly people know where to find you. <laughs> if they want a uh, a consultant interview prep but also um some advice on what you do and how they can do it for themselves and also you've just said yes to joining our commercial course um, yep. and talking about how to build and scale an online business with more detail yep. uh so that's going to happen for people listening in uh in august it'll start in august but you can actually sign up a long time before then uh, so just stay tuned to our mailing list because we'll tell you more. But anyway, thank you so much, Tessa. This has been an incredible, incredible episode. Um, and yeah, any last words? No, it's been fun. Great chatting to you. I feel yeah. like we could, we've could. we got lots to talk about and learn from each other. It's been great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And subscribe. <laughs>